kind of speak up. Um, and uh, I think Sam so can eventually get my slides up. If you want my slides, um, they are available on my web page, which you can get by Googling me. Um, and the uh, title is Explanation in Statistical Equilibrium Models and Social Sciences. Uh, and what I, I'm going to, I have only very limited time, so I'm going to try to move right along and set the stage for the discussion, which is the main point. Um, but to provide a concrete setting for the discussion, I just want to review very briefly a model of profit rate equalization that uh, Alice Scharfenegger and I uh, put together. That's it. Yes. Um, the background of this is rather interesting, and, but I don't have a lot of time to go into it. Um, this all started actually from um, my uh, lecturing in advanced political economy on the book by Far June, who spoke here last week, and um, Machover, um, calling for a statistical understanding of price. Now, I have to have some more control. Okay, Gregor Semenyuk and Al Scharfenegger heard of those lectures and decided to try to look into this question and found very good data on firm profit rates and discovered that firm profit rates in the United States, they use CompuStat data, this has since been extended to European firm data by Jerry Monier and Paolo Dos Santos, um, uh, they discovered two important things. One is that uh, if you look at the distribution of profit rates, this is the uh, histogram, basically, of profit rates with the profit rate along the uh, horizontal axis and the logarithm of the frequency with which you observe that profit rate on the vertical axis. Um, you always see a very sharply peaked distribution, which tends to have, in the large part of the data, uh, something like a skewed Laplace, so or maybe just plain Laplace. Distribution and this happens year after year after year. The central tendency of the profit rate changes from year to year, but the shape of this distribution, uh, the basic shape of the distribution, does not. Uh, first of all, this uh, strikingly confirms the classical theories of competition that mobility of capital is going to tend to equalize the profit rate, and that's a pretty important point. Uh, but it also uh, supports the idea of classical economists that these kinds of convergence are subject to gravitation, that is, the fluctuations around the central tendency, which we see in the constant uh, dispersion of profit rates. That type of behavior in physical sciences is often called a statistical equilibrium or statistical mechanical equilibrium. Uh, because it's a signal that there are some kind of regular statistical laws that are operating. Those regular statistical <coughs> laws can often be summarized by uh, maximizing the entropy of the distribution of the system over its states, in this, set, in this case profit rates, subject to some constraints that represent the physical laws that Clearly, in applying this kind of thing to social science, we have the question of how do you represent purposeful uh, behavior, or do you want to represent purposeful behavior, um, in this uh, type of uh, framework. <coughs> and uh, Alice and I uh, proposed a model along these lines, which we can use as a kind of an of a, um, example uh, of this. Uh, the idea here is that individual capitalists enter sectors, 
conditions of the work. So it involves employment in which power rates are high and exit sectors where they're low. And second, that the action of an entering sector tends to lower its profit rate and exiting the sector tends to raise its profit rate. So the statistical equilibrium is the result of this um, negative feedback process. It's statistical because the behavior of the catalyst is not, uh, we, at least we can't determine it uh, uh, deterministically from this kind of uh, uh, data. Um, okay, when you work this out, you can look at our paper for the details of this, you get a, a joint distribution over the profit rate, which in this uh, uh, expression is called X, and A, which is the action of either entering or exiting the market. So it's just a bind, but it's a very simple model, which there's no other choice, no choice to stay or anything like that. Um, but we can actually uh, work out the explicit uh, distribution, which depends on four parameters. Uh, the parameter T and U have to do with the behavior of the typical catalyst in responding to profit rate differences. U is the profit rate at which they tip over from being more likely to enter to being more likely, uh, to, more, more likely to exit to more likely to enter. T is the Steepness, uh, I'll show you a diagram of this, of the logistic curve that describes this behavior. Uh, gamma is a skewness parameter, which we won't be getting to, and beta is the parameter that, that measures the intensity of competition, that is, the impact of actual entry and exit on the profit rate in the sectors. Uh, And you, you can then fit this model, which is, got, which is pretty parsimonious, the data. For example, for 1975, we get these kinds of results. T is about 0.06, which means that 0.066% of profit rate is, roughly speaking, the scale on which the capitalists are sensitive to differences in the profit rate. It's not 0.0006, they don't respond to very tiny profit rate differentials, but uh, but it's not 60% or 600% either, so it's they do respond. Um, and the mean profit rate which I which they respond is about 20%. Um, so this fitted model uh, turns out to look uh, like this. The left hand panel uh, is the original data together fitted uh, distribution, and then the conditional distributions of profit rate on entry and exit, uh, which, as you would expect, show the uh, appropriate differences. The right-hand panel shows the implied behavior of the typical capitalist. Uh, as you go from the uh, left, which is low profit rates, to the right, which is high profit rates, the probability of entry rises from zero to one according to this logistic curve, which is characterized by this behavior vector T, and the probability of exit, which is just one minus the probability of entry, uh, goes to zero. So you get a pretty good uh, fit to the data. Very parsimonious explains something like 97% of the information uh, in the data. Uh, and then this slide summarizes this, uh, these results. The model confirms the Smithian classical long period theory pretty well, um, and it implies, as opposed to say theories of perfect competition, that there's an actual finite impact of every movement of capital on profit rates in the uh, sectors. Um, and I argue that the this PRSC model has content in two senses. First, changes in the model. Suppose we interchanged entry and exit, for example. You get a terrible model if we did that. So it's not as though this is just a fitting you know, curve, a curve fitting exercise. Uh, <coughs> and 
And second, the Jurassic model has strong evidence any proposed explanation of these marginal confidence distributions that are inconsistent. So if you have another uh, model, if you have another theory, if it is capable of, of predicting this distribution, you would like to be, have it come out to look like this, because otherwise it's Now, let me uh, try to finish up my part of this by raising uh, what seemed to me to be the main questions. These were uh, issues that arose in a very interesting and, to me, very helpful and enlightening email exchange that involved Paolo and Anwar and Sanjay, and that's partly why we were doing this session. So, the methodological and philosophical questions that seem to come up uh, fall into four categories as I see it. First, why maximize entropy? What's so magical about entropy? Uh, the maximizing entropy is something that constraints gives you a better model than doing something else. Second, if the RC model presents problems causes to propagate differentials with typical capitalism, does it have anything to say about what any particular capitalism to probable changes, because you can imagine that a theory of, of this kind of competition would try to predict exactly when this catalyst was going to move from this sector to that sector. Third, the QRSE model presents estimates of the impact of competition in some general sense on sector properties, but parallel to point two, uh, does it actually explain how energy and exit concretely affect sector properties? Maybe we find that when this particular firm moved into this particular sector, the way they affected profit rates was by product differentiation, or the way they affected profit rates was by price the competition. Um, and this model just says there's an impact, and it tries to measure the average impact. And then the fourth question, which is really sort of my question, is, well, how do you distinguish this from the Milton Friedman as if kind of reason? He said, well, OK, it's a uh, abstract model, so we know that its assumptions are not, strictly speaking, right. Not every firm, or maybe not any firm, is exactly like the typical capitalist. But um, um, the defense, it, the, the model, is that it's a good way of, of, of explaining this. Now, the data, now, I think there's a distinction between this kind of reasoning and the F was but perhaps we'll discuss that more. Okay, why maximize entropy? Well, there are really two different answers to this uh, question. I, I only have three minutes. I don't know what the problem is. Nobody. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, it's 20 Okay, so I, I have a little more. Seven oh, okay, from the empirical point of view, there's a very strong case for entropy maximization, which you can find uh, many in uh, many physics sources. The one that I prefer is uh, the E.T. James papers and uh, books on this question. Um, and there's a development of that in, by Thomas Golan And the basic argument, which I think you can make a very strong case for, is that uh, maximizing entropy, if you're trying to estimate a model, is a, is a way to avoid importing implicit assumptions into your estimation technique that are coming in through your choice of, <coughs> say, a particular model of randomness of errors or something of that kind. Because the entropy maximization is the most neutral uh, possible hypothesis that is compatible with having uh, variation. From the theoretical point of view, entropy, so I think the case for that is really pretty strong. It's not familiar to most economists and most econometricians, but um, uh, that's just because we are where we are in the history of economics and econometrics, and uh, sooner or later, From the 
very helpful in the energy maximization enters the PRIC model is due to the model and energy exit response of the individual catalyst to accompany the equations. It's that S, those S groups. So the question is why? Why is that a good theory, or is it a theory at all uh, to explain how the energy works? Well, the answer to that is a much more complicated answer. And um, let me start by pointing out that quantum response models of that type, which uh, which uh, are derived from and, max and maximizing energy subject to, say, a constraint on the satisfying expected property, are the best tool that econometricians have found for explaining this kind of behavior. So if you were just going to do plain old vanilla econometrics and you had data on actual movements, it would probably be come out as a little bit on a response model where the property of the higher the property is more likely to be that the equilibrium would be its capital rate. But the simple model of expected property maximization subject to the minimum energy constraint does raise a relevant theoretical question. What determines the energy constraint in a specific context and how does it vary? And to understand this, I think you have to understand uh, another part of James' and some of his philosophy of explanation which is a philosophy that depends on successive approximations. Um, one of the most beautiful examples of this is his discussion of the, what he calls the wolf dice theory, which is hilarious and really very <coughs> wonderful to read. Uh, but, the, but the broad uh, moral of James's point of view is to say something like this. He says, look, you have some a phenomenon. You're trying to explain. What's your first step, theoretically? You maximize energy. Well, if that does pretty well, then there's nothing to explain. Okay. If it doesn't do well, then it gives you a bad model, then that means you've got to add some constraints to represent relevant or physical or behavioral or other regularities, as we did, for example, using the Smithian idea. And his idea is you keep adding these constraints, and when you add the constraints, if you're on the right track, you get a better fitted model. Uh, and you also reduce the energy. Let me try to. Okay, second point. The typical and particular catalysts. Uh, well, suppose you had that data. Suppose you could stratify the capitals by such things as the size of the capital or uh, other plausible. Well, you might very well find that, that with more data that you uh, would uh, have differences in behavioral uh, predictions. But, but that is really about data limitation. I mean, the question is how, how if you only have the data on the marginal property data distribution, the best you can do is to assume that the capitals are typical in the sense that they are errors offset each other. But it also tells you that there's some content to this because you would, if you had a finer grade data set, you still would like it to come out to predict that capitalists start to get, get very interested in entry, uh, tip over from exit to entry around 20% of profit rate, and that the, uh, that the sensitivity is something like 6% um, difference. Uh, the question of the impact of entry and exit on sexual profit rates uh, is a rather parallel. Uh, it assumes a finite impact of entry and exit on sexual profit rates, but that, and that differs from the perfect competition model. In fact, there's very strong evidence against the perfect competition model. The QRC uh, are, again, a first approximation. If we have more detailed data, on particular episodes or particular classes of entry and exit, then we would get a more, uh, a more detailed picture of what's going on. And finally, this is my final point. Um, I would argue that Friedman's as if philosophy of science argues that the realism of the positive expert theory is irrelevant to its explanatory power, which depends only on the explanation of the prediction of the theory of 
head of peer review is a realism by extracting the concrete details of the phenomenon that is necessary, as Marx emphasizes in the introduction of the realism, to employ appropriate abstractions in theory that can be generalized in concrete circumstances. Smith's abstraction of perfect mobility capital, for example, never holds exactly. There are all these obstacles. These factors turned out quantitatively in some of the QRIC models by the MIT. Friedman's fallacy lies in the assumption of inappropriate abstractions that cannot be generalized. For example, the Wallachian assumption that the price is equal to marginal cost and that uh, FDNs that have a first order zero uh, impact on a market uh, can represent the behavior of concrete. I would argue the reason we don't do that is because it implicitly assumes in the language of entropy that the entropy is zero, or the behavior of entropy is zero, which is an ideal state that uh, is like absolute zero in physics. So the issue is the, the successive approximations. Uh, do you have a framework that allows for successive approximations? Is it appropriate? Abstraction in the sense that it allows you to become more concrete. Um, and that to understand, you know, the other has been writing about this in his thesis, perhaps even very well, I think, that uh, you might think of these kinds of models as classes of models, not as a specific model, but as a, as a representative class of models um, because of their statistical character and that they have. Oh, leave it there. It's just recording your voice. Somebody else has to deal with that. Sorry. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? They, they want, yeah, they want you in that place. All right. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the light, bright light shining. You can say you can you can you think of as optimism. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, the question concerned uh, what is the place of these methods in the social sciences and Uh, or 
set of methods that social science has to offer for understanding the world. And obviously, uh, some question of that is what's the place they have in economics in particular. Okay, so that was the methodological concern which I began my own inquiry to conduct it uh, with. And uh, that then occasioned the broader conversation which also incorporated uh, our work uh, on both econophysics and statistics. Since then, I haven't uh, revisited the, uh, the uh, conversation, but I know that other people have been reading it. So, for example, uh, recently uh, we heard from Venkat, Venkat, Venkat right. Subramanian, who is a chemical engineer <coughs> working on income distribution in Colombia, and uh, Ravi Kanbur, and he, uh, Ravi Kanbur being a well known mainstream economist, have uh, agreed to organize a conference about statistics. And apparently, they've taken quite a lot of interest in the correspondence that we had uh, because it raised a number of interesting issues. So, please, uh, please read that. Uh, now, proponents of statistical mechanics approaches have presented them as providing a break. And what I want to ask is in what sense is this the case, and to what extent do they need to be justified? Now, if you open uh, the textbook on statistical mechanics by Reef, which is one of the standard textbooks, one that I actually used as an undergraduate. In the introductory chapter, he distinguishes between four different kinds of methods that are used in statistical physics. The first uh, defines the relation between, these are his words, the macroscopic parameters of a system in equilibrium. That's thermodynamics. So it's not concerned with question of what's going on at the atomic level is concerned with the question of the systemic properties and their relationship. The famous equation, ideal gas equation, Ev equals nRT, is an example of a thermodynamic equation. I right? you can think about Keynesian aggregates, macroeconomic aggregates being specified as existing in some relationship. That would be by way of an analog. It's, it's a assertion at the level of aggregates below. The second uh, that uh, Reef uh, distinguishes them. involves statements about a system based on microscopic properties of particles and laws of mechanics governing their behavior. This is statistical mechanics. So it is crucial that it involves some assertion of what is happening at the micro level, at the atomic level in particular, so as to understand what is the relationship between the macro and the micro in these terms. In economic language, we might talk about methodological foundation, like, excuse me, Methodological individualism or micro foundations. And indeed, in the uh, discussion, Reef emphasizes that all of the results of thermodynamics, and he highlights all, can be derived from statistical mechanics understood in this sense. Okay, so the ability to micro found the macro assertions is crucial to the claim being made on behalf of statistical mechanics. But it is also the case that some type of priority is being attached to the description of what's taking place at the atomic level uh, in order to uh, uh, give uh, legitimacy to statistical mechanics. But he points out that both of these, by and large, have concerned systems in equilibrium. And we can also be concerned with systems not in equilibrium. There are systems not in equilibrium, which we have to sometimes make sense of. And the former two methods can only make limited general statements based upon the study of irreversible processes. He calls these irreversible thermodynamics and irreversible statistical mechanics. So we may be able to say some very general things about that, right? Such as that when you open a door and uh, uh, it's cold outside, the hot air tends to flow outward. That's an example of such a statement. But we can't, this, we can't uh, say a great deal about, uh, uh, about the processes that flow Finally, study in detail the interactions of all particles in the system and calculate parameters of microscopic significance applicable to systems not in equilibrium. This is the uh, holy grail, as it were, but it's extremely difficult computationally, nearly impossible. One can make computational approximations at best. So the methodological individualist might say, as Stephen Lukes, the sociologist, famously said in a debate, uh, 
uh, that in principle, all facts about society can be reduced to facts about individuals' interactions. It doesn't mean it's a good idea to do that, though, because it gets extremely complicated very quickly. Now, I see the two main contributions of the contemporary revival of statistical mechanics and economics, which I associate with colleagues in the department, as being as follows. First, the idea of equilibrium is stability of a statistical distribution. And in particular, crucial here, individual optimization is not required. But we could focus on statistical evolution, folks, on statistical evolution of a system without positing equilibrium. Right? In the way that agent-based models, for example, have as one of their claims that they can help us understand the evolution of a system without necessarily positing that an equilibrium is ever reached. And similarly, here we might be interested in the question of how statistical distribution changes over time without necessarily <coughs> positing that there is an equilibrium. But nevertheless, the idea of equilibrium, which is to say relative stability of the statistical has been at the heart of the contemporary revival. Second is the idea of entropy maximization as the methodological key, as we just heard from Dr. to prediction of equilibrium distributions. But as we also heard, the specific derivations that are made depend crucially on the specific constraints that are assumed. And I think, I'm borrowing from the famous phrase of Eugene Wigner here, that there is a claim of what might be called unreasonable effectiveness in this famous article he referred to the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physical sciences. It appears that there's a claim of unreasonable effectiveness that somehow or the other the entropy maximization uh, principle is providing very, it has enormous generative power to give rise to results that uh, correspond closely to the reality and this is a reason for us to offer respect. And I'm going to question that. Some anticipations of the theory, I don't have time so I won't labor this, but I think it would be quite interesting for someone who has an interest in the history of thought to go into the anticipations of, statistically, of statistical mechanics methods uh, being used in economics. Some of you may be aware of the Le Chatelier Samuelson principle, which Le Chatelier, uh, uh, well, which Samuelson posited at the individual level, but others have argued uh, should be also thought of as pertaining to macro uh, parameters. Uh, the work of George Esmond Logan, and this is misspelled. Isaac Asimov uh, uh, student knows this, Harry Selden, okay, that's Harry Selden, the uh, founder of psychohistory in the Foundation Trilogy of Science Fiction, uh, who uh, basically founded an efficacious social science by positing that although individual behaviors were unpredictable, uh, the behavior of groups of individuals were quite predictable. My basic concern is that of what is an explanation from a philosophical point of view. And I want to underline this is neither description nor prediction. It's not, it, it, it doesn't help me in knowing whether or not something is a good explanation to know that it is effective, either as a method of description or as a method of prediction. One needs for an explanation to know why something is the case, and I would suggest in terms of processes, also sometimes called in social inquiry mechanisms. The object of explanation must be related, causally, we usually think of, but I'm going to add it, we'll talk about this if you like, conjuncturally or logically, to the explanatory factors. But when can we determine that an explanation has been provided? Judgment is required for this, right? So there's an onion, we peel the layers of the onion, we kind of come up with another layer, and um, we have to make some assessment as to whether or not uh, an adequate explanation has been provided, which involves judgment. Or as the political scientists and others like sometimes like to say, it can't be turtles all the way down. Right? Turtles, you can say that one turtle stands on top of another turtle, but that only goes so far. Now, what is the presupposition of equilibrium talk in this uh, domain? And in particular, if maximum entropy works, quote unquote, then why does it work? Now, on one view, which is I think the most prevalent view in statistical mechanics, explanations involving maximum entropy presuppose that an equilibrium has been attained as the end point of some process. And I will explain a little bit more about this in the next slide. Uh, some process of, for example, uh, molecular diffusion or interaction. But would that process itself not need to be specified in order to provide an explanation? For example, Brownian motion. Right? Brownian motion is very crucial to our understanding of how molecules 
rely on it to give us the sense that there is an explanation beyond simply uh, referring to the idea of maximum entropy. Another new explanation involving maximum entropy involve the idea, and I believe this is associated with James, that any given realization of world among the possible worlds characterized by a given set of constraints, which we abstractly specify, is drawn from the maximum entropy distribution. Okay, so the world we live in is just one world drawn from that distribution. These are two different ideas. The first approach involves the assumption of what is often called ergodicity, right? that the time average equals the average of states in a statistical ensemble. And this cannot be assured, even in physical systems, but it is especially problematic in economic and in social life. It involves the idea that over time, to speak very roughly, all of the states are, are visited on average according to their place in the distribution of the frequency that they have visited the distribution. Now that seems to be plausible for tomato soup, right? You mix in the cream to tomato soup, the cream molecules of cream are more or less evenly distributed in the among the molecules of tomato, but it's not terribly plausible with respect to uh, uh, economic and uh, social life. And one reason for that is that the processes of change themselves change. Change changes as Roberto Unger puts it in this book, Please Smoke. There's a lack of stationarity of the data generating process, let alone ergodicity. By the way, the argue this is true even in physics, I'm not arguing that. They argue this is true on cosmological time scales, even in physics, that gravitational, the gravitational constant, for example, and other constants actually change over cosmological time. Um, but putting that to one side, certainly I think it's true that for social and economic life, the fact that change changes is very, very crucial. The, the, the fact that there are, uh, that the US Supreme Court has ruled in favor of unlimited campaign donations by corporate interests through various mechanisms is something that influences what kinds of processes of change are possible. So there are there are hierarchies, there are there's the role of institutions of political economy and so on in determining how change changes something we can do this way. The second approach, which views the world we live in as having been being a single draw from the maximum entropy distribution, relies on the notion that we've adequately characterized the constraints to begin with. And it also provides no insight as to how the draw happens. Now, how do we know we have characterized the constraints adequately? Duncan appeals to the idea of successively closer approximations to the truth. This is, to my mind, a very positivistic model. I think there's a certain degree of uh, conceit on the part of the analyst in framing the constraints and believing those to be right about their factors. In my view, neither approach can explain change in the constraints that are assumed to condition the process. And individual entropic processes must be, must be viewed as linked with larger systems, which raises questions of explanatory error. Um, one of the, the uh, ways we might think about this in the economic and social context concerns, for example, uh, the nation state within the broader global uh, scenario. Can entropy maximization explain phenomena central to the social world? The second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy tends to increase in closed systems, but we're usually interested in explaining phenomena that belong to individual parts of larger closed systems, and sometimes very small parts of that. Right? And that's crucial to explaining many phenomena, physical phenomena sometimes, but certainly biological and social uh, phenomena. Uh, apparently, James Lovelock, the, the uh, biologist and author of the Gaia Hypothesis, when he was consulted by NASA on the question of how to determine whether or not life existed on Mars, suggested that one would look for entropy decrease, local entropy decrease, because life is nothing other than entropy decrease. So this is a case of Hamlet without the prince. We really can't think or talk about any meaningful phenomenon, evolutionary or social, institutional, and political economic, without thinking about how we consciously and intentionally decrease entropy, and how those, that decrease in entropy propounds itself over time, and not merely the question of how entropy is ostensibly uh, and in the limit maximum. Now, one of my questions in all of this is where is the human being? In what ways does the maximum entropy methodology recognize individual and collective agency and other aspects of the specificity of the human being? Intentional action, not Brownian motion or random collisions, are reasons that particular states are more likely than others. In the correspondence, I gave the example to Duncan of uh, wealth 
preservation and expansion. But people have an interest in having more wealth. And that provides a definite gradient to the direction, as it were, of individual action. It's not a question of random action in all directions. Where do the causal relations in economic and social life reside? What is the locus of the deep structures which supposedly give rise to the causal regularities that are identified? And more right here, again, where do I phrase deep structures? But if you'd like to use Roy Bhaskar, which is not my favorite. We need some analog to physical forces or biological drives for adequate explanations as opposed to mere descriptions. I've already mentioned formative projects, institutions, and the economy, all necessarily missing from this mechanistic picture. I'm nearing the time, uh, my time being completed, so let me move toward uh, some, some last issues. Robustness, as I've already mentioned, the specification of the constraints is, is crucial. If I, if I lay down an additive uh, as opposed to a multiplicative constraint, I will get an exponential income distribution or I will get a greater income distribution. Again, something discussed in my correspondence with uh, uh, Duncan. Which one is it? On what basis and when do we know that it's good enough? Baker Baker Subramanian raised the issue that it might be possible that the supposed good fit of the Pareto distribution and the upper tail of the income distribution has been a mistaken inference. And in fact, the log normal distribution is uh, more uh, Evolving data generating processes can reshape the constraints and thus the parameters as well as functional forms that define solutions to the static we can see in fact and problem. But why do they change over Curve fitting. Now, Duncan said that the exercise is not one of mere curve fitting, but I fail to understand why. Because the, the nature of the exercise done uh, uh, in these various papers involves uh, taking some historical data and fitting a curve with an assumed functional form to the historical data. And indeed, I would suggest there, is even, there has even been a degree of uh, selectivity with respect to the constraints that are assumed in order find a family of functions which best fits the available data. And I, I, I don't find those with a down example. Is the Dos Santos et al. papers on an asymmetric, uh, uh, which find that an asymmetric Laplace distribution best um, characterizes the distribution of Tobin's Q. And in particular, he assumes in order to derive that, or he and his colleagues do two moment conditions, one of which involves the average level of profits, and the other involves the absolute value of the level of profits. And I've had some discussion with him about this. I fail to understand how that the second constraint has any kind of natural meaning. He has an interpretation for it in terms of uh, debt that is generated by firms. But to my mind, it's a very ad hoc interpretation which is put in place in order to justify the derivation of a family of functions which happens to fit the data. Alternative functional forms can likely also fit the data. And we really need to have a horse race the alternative functional forms before we can conclude that uh, uh, that mere seeming uh, uniform convergence as identified by the full black library divergence criterion or whatever you like uh, is a sufficient uh, uh, basis for assuming that, uh, that, 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 that the technique has indeed had a reasonable effectiveness. So to conclude, I want to ask, are we really just adding one more language game to how it is that and of course, we can talk about the world in various ways. I can posit one language game or another, and we can play within its rules. We can try to describe the world according to the words and phrases of that language game, but so what? Right? Uh, as uh, uh, Srafa famously said to Wittgenstein, when Wittgenstein begged him to continue their conversations, Wittgenstein said, we can talk about anything you want. And Srafa replied apparently, yes, but in your way. <laughs> so I think this is a research program worth exploring, but it requires much fuller justification, and in my view, is unlikely to provide a salve to our broader social scientific views. Thank you.
few months on J side there. <laughs> It's better than my email, but <laughs> well, um, let me start by saying that I find myself halfway between Duncan and Pablo and Sanjeev, which will be an astonishing position because that would make me a moderate. <laughs> 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 I think the first point to understand that we all share is that the object is to explain uh, persistent patterns. And secondly, the object is to explain them, at least from my point of view, from some fundamental principle. What you view, actually, is a fundamental principle. Uh, I tend not to view it that way because I don't really understand the economic rationale. I don't understand what can be constructed. I don't understand the micro rationale. But let me just make a point. The, the pattern that, that, uh, that Duncan and also Paolo talked about is a kind of Laplace distributions. They are two exponentials, so you're going to make it somehow. And there are different ways of deriving that, um, including quantum response, but quantum response, for example, quantum response with three states. Minus one, zero, plus one. Uh, but they don't make any economic sense for me uh, because there's no uh, micro foundation. And there's another case where I'm, uh, as an economist, I need to know what's the story. So my own work, which I'll present in February, starts at the other end, which is the well observed distribution of wages. And that distribution uh, is consistently either a gamma distribution or exponential. If you, if you just fix the points in broad data set, it looks like a straight line in a broad linear scale, so it's exponential, and the top part is a power. This is Yakovenko's work that started this whole, uh, restarted this whole discussion begun with Blackberry in 1898 and uh, brought to the present time. Now, I can explain uh, with uh, uh, this process by means of a, a, a fundamental principle of economics, which is arbitrage, movement of wages. So we get two sets of high wages here, low wages here, and they will drift in that direction. But that drift will encounter all kinds of obstacles and collisions and some returns along the way. And so the first approximation, you abstract from the details and say, OK, that drift is specific but for each individual. But the obstacles we take to be first summarized by some kind of neutral noise. Now, uh, the Gaussian is a classic example. We typically use stochastic differential equation to, to capture all the details. <coughs> but because the detail is so specific, we cannot capture them in any specific way. This is how statistical mechanics began to so try to capture the patterns of individual particles bouncing around in the box, but the details of their paths were really beyond, and are still beyond, any technique except looking at the group. And the group has a certain distribution of outcomes, and these are often statistical distributions that are recurrent. I wouldn't say stable, but they're recurrent. So this is closer to Selden's view that uh, group behavior has an emergent property that the individual's behavior we, we can't necessarily even characterize. And just take, like in my book, I use this example. Uh, if you take consumers individually, then it's pretty damn hard to write something about their behavior. I mean, utility functions might be absolutely stupid, but if you were to try to do it, you have to partition all kinds of cultural and personal and local and other things, and you could possibly do it, but you'd still end up with a statistical explanation. The individuals don't necessarily follow that path. So I argue that, in fact, if you accept the idea that uh, group behavior is emergent properties, and which are often not dependent on the details, then you can explain all the patterns of the 
demand curves and elasticities and all that without any reference whatsoever to optimizing and so on. Uh, and this is actually an argument made by Robert Laughlin, a physicist, uh, who said, uh, argues that quantum mechanics is only one way to get to the aggregate, and there are many different physical laws in the uh, uh, macro sphere of physics, uh, relativity theory, but not grounded in quantum mechanics, have never been grounded in quantum mechanics, but they're true nonetheless, uh, because they have been grounded in another approach, a macro approach. The macro approach is saying, look, we're observing empirical, uh, and we're observing emergent properties, and we try to explain empirical phenomena. It's very important for physicists are not trying to derive necessarily generally speaking from some abstract principle, they're using an abstract principle to explain it. Uh, let me illustrate that point with uh, this question that Duncan made, which is very important. It, it, a good abstraction should be capable of being extended and generalized without violating the abstraction. A concretization is not a violation, it's an uh, extension of the argument. We know, for instance, that Newton says that two objects in a vacuum will fall, and that's actually true if you construct a vacuum and show a feather and a, and a tennis ball falling. But you also know when you enter air into it, the feather will fall more slowly, and that's not a, a contradiction. It's exactly a necessary outcome under the presence of the fluid. When Newton was doing that, he was aware of that, but he ran into another problem. He could not explain from this principle, which explained feathers and, and other objects, why the moon didn't fall to the earth. And it took him, I recall, roughly seven years to figure out and he waited, by the way. If he died, then we'd have volume one and volume two of you. As someone said in an early talk, he didn't have to cook his own dinner, so he had plenty of time. So he managed to work out that the law of gravity, viewed as an abstract thing pulling you down, was actually capable of explaining orbit because if the two objects are in motion relative to each other, then a, a persistent pattern some kind of orbits, and the orbits are not necessarily stable, but if the orbit is stable, then you observe a number like that. That law is enormously influential, and it was Kepler who generalized that to ellipses rather than circular orbits. So again, it's a long, lifelong endeavor to explain this pattern. And that explained many, many things in the, in the physical universe and the macro universe. So one of the points that Laughlin makes is that uh, the emergent properties don't really depend on the micro foundation. And I show in my book, you take four micro foundations, utility maximizing, perfect knowledge, all of that stuff, or you could take random behavior, as Becker showed, or you could take a variety of models, we can adapt the model uh, from, from uh, Gossi of uh, uh, behavior, and some individuals act in one way, and some other individuals act another way, we show that you can do identical aggregate behavior. What's the point of that? The point is that you cannot tell from the aggregate behavior which road left led to what. You need to walk back and say, what's the explanation? How we distinguish between two? This is where Friedman's argument falls down. It isn't that you can view him as talking about emergent properties, but he does it from a manner that doesn't hold up to scrutiny. You cannot say, well, the details of the micro don't matter. There's a lot. You can distinguish by asking that question, does it make sense in another domain? And that's how science proceeds. That's a legitimate way to proceed. Now, uh, then I want to comment two things on uh, the idea of change and changes. I completely agree with that. I mean, how can we talk about capitalism without observing that it changes? But then you have a problem. How do you then also observe that some patterns don't change? I spend a lot of time in my book showing long waves and profit rate equalization. And that is the same thing as identifying what makes a virus a virus, in particular a cold virus or an AIDS virus. It sheep mutates. So it protects itself from attacks and sneaks past things. But it remains an AIDS virus because its core does not mutate. So what's the core of capitalism? It's profit rate. I would argue that in order to show persistent pattern, you have to relate them back to fundamental principles, and that's why profit rate equalization at Duncan and others have done, uh, or a wage rate equalization that arbitrage is a fundamental principle. 
will always be there as long as capitalism is allowed. And it's not just working, by the way. Capitalism moved to lower wage labor, as we know, all over the world. So it's, it's a two sided move, not just one. Uh, uh, finally, uh, the last point is the uh, interesting thing about adding constraints and, uh, I'm sorry, the interesting thing about uh, regulating capitalism in this framework. What I think of is the framework talks about uh, the mobility of capital. And then, the, if I understand it correctly, the distribution of the rest comes from detailed responses, from the quantum responses of the capital. But I have a problem there because I think the observed distribution is made up of two types of capital regulating and non regulating capital. The capital is subject to the equalization, and capital is subject to the expulsion from this club. Obviously, the death rates and birth rates are related in this quantum sense to that, but we need to be able to talk about how the two sets operate. Now, I must confess, I have been working on that, but I haven't. I'm behind uh, uh, Duncan on this kind of understanding of these processes, but I would need to be able to do that to explain why you get uh, the Laplace type distribution. And uh, when I look at the data, I observe that a whole set of firms have negative. How long do they have negative properties? We can't track them usually in the data, but it's obvious that if they have them, their probability of extinction goes up, and the ones who have high profit rates have probability of expansion. It's quite a logical thing. Their tribe expands. It's not to be capital entry, they can expand themselves. So that's very close to this argument. But I don't think I need uh, entropy maximum. I don't think I should. I don't need it for the wages, that's for sure. And I believe that representing these expansion and, and uh, contraction processes is an important thing. Uh, we can get to that, but I don't have it. And that's the last point. Everything about science involves faith, quasi-religious faith. <laughs> There's no way you sit down and try to solve Fermat's last theorem unless you were crazy and had the faith to do it. So let's celebrate that it's important to have the faith try. It doesn't guarantee success. Somebody said, uh, felt back and follow. Okay. This is all very exciting. I'm here to convince you that amongst the four of us, we have about eight different positions on the issue, which means that we're either rabbis or Trotskyists. <laughs> I mean that in the best of possible ways. Okay, I've been thinking about this for, for quite some time. I'm going to give a talk next week about a particular paper that will in many ways reflect the, the view that has developed over time in this work. I want to address a few other things. Um, that have come up in the discussion of the day in my capacity, mainly as a discussant. Part of what has taken me so long to actually start producing and coming out with my take on this is that it took me a while to realize that in a very real way, the kind of question that these methods help us address in economics are questions that the physicists themselves have problems with. Mainly, a well worked out and widely accepted view of the integration of the microscopic and the macroscopic. Both in economics and in physics, there is a tendency toward individualist reductionism. It plagues thought fundamentally, and that very seriously limits, one, our capacity to understand complex systems, and it also limits our capacity to understand what the principle of maximum entropy really is. Because all it is, it's a heuristic that allows us to link the states at the micro level with what are basically the probabilities with which we will observe different macroscopic states. And the, the forward statement of the principle of maximum entropy is the simple contention that cannot be refuted that we should expect, based on what we know, to observe at the macro level that which will be most common across all possible micro level configurations of the system. In other words, we are just asking for a certain logical consequence in our statements about the macro in relation to what we think we know about the micro. And let me underline what we think we know, because this is embedded very much in a sense of work in progress of the development of knowledge. 
I, I have appreciated all the discussions. I'm going to take issue not with Sanjay, but, but with Reef, because I think it's illustrative of, of what I'm trying to get at. Reef, I think, is wrong in, in as much in, in, the, in what you attributed to Reef, namely that the principle of maximal <coughs> entropy works because it corresponds to the microkinetic behavior of particles. And the wonderful source about this is this obscure little text known as the Delaware Lecture by E.P. James, which actually makes the following point that I cannot explain in detail here. But the reason we get PV and RT, say, as a description of macroscopic interrelationships, is not so much because of the detailed microkinetic evolutions of the particles. It is because PV and RT can be understood as the systemic expression of the conservation of energy in a system with certain characteristics. That's all. PV and RT is, in terms of truth content, equal to the statement that energy is conserved across interactions. That's all that we're saying. Now, what the hell does this have to do with social science? Well, what it what does to me, and I think I have like, hold on, I'm controlling the time, so. What it does to me is the following. It gives us a, a different way to think about micro and macro that allows us to avoid the tendency toward individual individualist reductionism, but also allows us to pursue observational work that can give us observational foundations for a contemporary political economy. We are not starting from hypotheses or statements. We're not saying, hey, let's try to constraint and see what it looks like. What we're typically doing is this. Let me open a quick parenthesis before that, because I should have started with this. I'm a big fan of geology. And that's not just because the geology department was right next to the physics department at the University of Maryland when I was an undergraduate student, but because they have an accepted methodological approach, which is fundamentally plural. They recognize that their subject of study is complex, and they recognize that sometimes you need to be an astronomer, sometimes a, biolo uh, a biologist, sometimes a physicist, sometimes a, a chemist, and it doesn't matter. There's a plurality of methods, and I approach all of this in, in that spirit. A little bit like the drunk man and the lamppost looking for the key. And what's the key here? The key is that when we observe these distributions of certain nations and certain quantities out there, we get what Duncan and uh, Almond were pointed to. We get these stubborn-ass patterns that won't go away. And they won't go away over time, and they won't go away across country. And these are non-trivial patterns about quantities that pertain to individuals that are fundamentally interrelated. So we're not dealing here with some extension of the central limit theorem or some uninformative result. We are dealing with patterns of organization that are telling us something formal, not concrete, formal, about the patterns of determination that are generating what we observe. Right? So to my mind, these repeated patterns are, they are screaming at us, please explain us. And what's beautiful about this method is that the kind of explanation that you reach for, right, can very easily be explanations that make recourse to emergent macroscopic properties to which individual outcomes are subordinated. This is a natural language for the law of unintended consequences that has been emphasized, and also the law of, um, I think I'm reaching for Becker here, the law of persistent, um, robust indifference to microkinetic or micro-level details in the macroscopic outcome. So we have Becker. We have Keynes, paradox of Frick. We have Smith. We have Marx. We have Steindl. We have uh, Eugene Fama. All, in, all interesting contributions have, that are inviting us to realize that the individual intention and the individual evolution is not the best way to characterize and understand observable outcomes. This is not to say that individual conceptualizations have no space in abstraction in the broad toolkit that we use. But when we are, look, when we are dealing with actual observation, we are typically observing things that pertain to individuals but are very much the result of individual interactions. Meaning that if we measure or if we observe and confirm a certain statistical regularity in patterns across individuals that are so related, what we are observing is the outcome of interdependencies. What we're observing is a systemic result that requires a systemic um, answer of some sort. I have a couple of responses here. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to another talk after this, so I'm more scatterbrained than, than my usual uh, uh, today. Um, yes, two more things and I'll stop. Um, 
This is important. When we talk about emergence, there are basically two conceptualizations of emergence that, 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 that we can uh, accept. One is what people call epistemic, and another one is omni. What do we mean by this? An epistemic understanding of emergence basically means that we recognize that there are certain macroscopic features that emerge that we have a hard time explaining in terms of individual parts. But there's a far stronger version of the recognition of emergence that actually says something along the lines of this. The regularities upon which we can predicate an understanding of the functioning of a system are defined by the structure of the system and not simply by the characteristics of the individuals. And it seems to me that in a lot of these distributions that we're observing, that's what we're seeing. Things like income expenditure identities, things like input-output relationships, things like the fundamentally competitive nature of the system, things like arbitrage and the attempt to profit maximize. So, while Sanjay is absolutely right that in any attempt to tackle the inverse ill post problem of attempting to offer an account for something that you observe, inferring it, there is always the question of, is this the real answer? I would posit that this is inescapable. I would posit that this should not stop us from attempting to at least construct certain um, uh, accounts or explanations that are in line with underlying <coughs> economic principles that at least as a first approximation, as Duncan was, uh, was pointing out, are consonant with observation. What we define from observation is in many ways a negative criterion. Anything that doesn't account for this persistently or through some uh, process of abstraction and articulation with more concrete determinations should be discarded. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but really compared to what passes for economic analysis out there, sorry, that kind of came out a little bit stronger than I, uh, I meant to say. It's infinitely better. And it allows us to avoid, again, individualist reductionism on the one hand, and a kind of uh, ungrounded macroscopic uh, approach to economic analysis. So while very, very much um, attuned to, 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 the, to the criticism of the unavoid, I would say that these are unavoidable difficulties in the world. Um, and it should push us to, you know, obviously, triangulate with other methods. Sometimes you go and you study people, you ask them questions. There's a variety, variety of different methods that should nevertheless not stop us from proceeding uh, with these methods. And I've spoken for about 13 minutes, so I'll stop. Thank you. Please speak loudly for the to see if we can record the questions or maybe we would Yes. 
to Duncan because you said that the maximal entropy approach is the most neutral way of a model but if our approach to observations is actually theory dependent what do you mean by most neutral? Yeah, I have a question on uh, the question that relates to Delighted I am at the uh, at the debate. I mean, that, that's what, what I was hoping for. in this kind of level of discussion, I think, is terrific and uh, makes you think really hard and asks really good, good questions. And there are many things to respond to, um, but let me try to um, to limit uh, responses. Um, Sonia has many. Many interesting things uh, in, in Sanjay's uh, comments, and I, I want to ponder them and think about them some more. I, I would want to uh, just respond to a couple of points where I think there's a little um, gap in, in understanding. Uh, one is uh, this question of is this a breakthrough or is it a general method that's going to solve all the problems of social science? I, I do not believe that. Uh, I believe it can. I think uh, Paolo explained why this way of thinking can be exciting in social science because it opens up some new perspectives for understanding how we articulate uh, the, the relation between uh, micro and macro, and between individual behavior and aggregates and stuff like that. But I don't think it, it cannot possibly be a, a magic skeleton key that's going to unlock all of the questions. And in particular, um, uh, I think uh, Sanjay is right in emphasizing the uh, limitations of this to situations where there's a kind of quasi equilibrium. So it can't really explain the evolution of constraint of all the constraints or anything like that. I mean, that, that's just not the way this kind of reasoning works. On the other hand, um, I think. Maybe um, 
shortchanging the position a little bit over how much institutions are important. And maybe, Martin, this is uh, relevant to your, to your comments, too. For example, in this profit rate thing, are there economic institutions there? Of course there are economic institutions. Do hunter-gatherers uh, maximize a profit rate? No. It's completely, uh, you know, you have to have the institutional uh, background, which I are uh, constantly emphasizing, and I think he's exactly right. You got a capitalist system, that's why the profit rate is important. Smith's big discovery was that, that uh, agents, capitalists, try to maximize their profit rate, not other things like their personal uh, well being or, or something else. Um, finally, um, Shristi, to your, you asked for a little more clarification on the F twist. I think the F twist issue is very it's really worth talking and thinking through until we come to uh, as good an understanding of it as, as we can come to. I, I think actually Ankur did a better job than I did in uh, explaining this point with his example of the feather and the tennis ball. The F twist, it seems to me the problem with the F twist has to have to do with your theory of approximations and therefore your understanding of the relation between the concrete and the abstract. Now, obviously, I know because I've talked to many of them that it is hugely puzzling for people at your stage of development, and it should be uh, puzzling. Just which abstractions are the right abstractions? <laughs> is it general equilibrium theory? Is it the labor theory of value? And what, what, what's the right, how do you decide which is the right? Disoriented, you're, you're bombarded by uh, many different plausible perspectives and theoretical ideas, and it's very hard to, to figure out what uh, works. Well, I won't have a magic answer to that either, except I, I would say, first of all, let's, I think I'm going to put this in a very important problem with the this, which is, 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 for example, the concept of Aurasian market is it generalizable to more concrete circumstances? Which I don't think it is. Is the uh, type of profit rate equalization model that uh, I described generalizable? Yes, because you have a parameter in there, this behavior temperature T, which quantifies to some degree how close you are to the ideal abstract complete equalization of the rate of profit. So those are formal things. Now, how you decide whether it's right to approach economics uh, as an expression of human development or as the uh, pursuit of self-interest within certain institutional um, constraints, I, I mean, that I think is just a very personal thing. And you have to gradually feel your way and decide what, uh, what you think works. And a lot, I'll tell you, I think how it, what happens in most people's scientific biography, what people believe in is what works for them. And what it means to work for them is that they can write a paper about it. So very quickly, we don't have a lot of time. Thank you all. Participation in this discussion. Uh, I'd like to make four points. Uh, first, regarding Duncan's uh, concession, I think, but maybe it's not because maybe it's what he thought all along that maximum entropy methods, in fact, have a restrictive scope of application. I would say, in response, then we need to know more about what defines that scope. What are the limits? What are the principles which allow us to determine whether or not it is appropriate in a specific case? And I have to say, I'm not terribly happy with. The last uh, thing that you said, if that's the conclusion, namely, whatever allows us to write a paper is the determination of what works. And in fact, I'm not even happy with saying that what works is the determination of what we should do, because there is a danger of circularity there, insofar as conceptions of what work 
are highly underspecified. So I think that we need to give more principled content to the question of what method when. And I think that insofar as this discussion has initiated a further round, uh, I go through rounds of, of conversation about that, it, it's very well. And to my mind, as I said, the question of the specificity of the human being and of human societies will be very important in answering that. It might not be for others. They might think that there's an exact analogy between the application of entropy maximization in physical systems and in social, the social world. I find that identified. It's possible. And someone might try to argue. Second, on the question of micro-foundations, I just want to underline, uh, <coughs> this is specifically with respect to my one. I was not, um, and I don't think he's suggested that I was, but just to be absolutely clear, I was not suggesting that one has to have highly specific micro-foundations to have a full explanation. In fact, uh, it might suffice to have very thin micro-foundations, so to speak. For example, that firms, on average, tend to pursue profits, whether or not they ever maximize them, and some of them may never do so at all. So there has to be some directionality, and I think this is true even in Becker's framework insofar as the budget constraints slope is what enforces that. Uh, some kind of gradient uh, that uh, in the system that helps us to understand why the system operates in the way that it does. And my suggestion was merely that behavioral interpretations of some kind, we don't have to have profit maximization, let alone utility maximization of some kind, would play a very important role in that. And whether or not you thought with Reef in the case of physical systems that all thermodynamic macro laws could be derived from microdynamics, you might still think that having some story about the microdynamics was important to having what we call an explanation, as opposed to having a simply logical conception of uh, entropy maximization as being the that brings me to my third point. Paulo claimed that it is simply, simply a matter of logic that one ought to adopt the entropy maximization hypothesis. I don't agree with that. I don't see how it's a matter of logic. I think that that is subscribing to the um, uh, assumption of erudicity. Uh, you are shaking your head, so you don't think so. But I think that's a conversation that we have to have. Now, I did lay out in my slides two possibilities as to how one would justify the entropy maximization hypothesis. One involves the assumption of erudicity. All of you know Paul Davidson spent many years arguing against its relevance in social and economic systems. So you can read that if you like, among other things. But I did also recognize what I understand to be the James defense, which involves the notion that our world just happens to be a draw from that distribution. I don't find that terribly plausible for the reasons I mentioned either. Whatever, but whichever it is, it's not a matter of mere logic, as far as I understand it. I think you're going to have to go beyond an assertion if you're going to have us agree to that. And then finally, I think that we really need to have a fuller demonstration of the so, so, supposed empirical regularities that exist in the distributions concerned, and in particular one that precedes rather than follows the exercise of entropy maximization in some theoretical system where there, have been, there has been postulated, um, it has been postulated that certain constraints exist. So for example, I think that in the case of income distributions, one can go around the world and look at the income distributions and see do they in fact have certain determinative patterns. Do they uh, seem to correspond to certain kinds of functional forms? If that's the case, then we can ask the question, given that observed fact, why is that so? And perhaps entropy maximization might have something to offer there. I don't completely discount that possibility. Right? But that would be the right way to proceed. It's, it's, it's like a classical regression analysis. You start with a hypothesis of some kind. Test the hypothesis, and I, I think that um, that insofar as we are going about it the other way around, it looks a bit like, as I suggested, curve fitting. One could be a little less polite and call it analogous to regression fishing. But I, I'm not yet convinced that the supposed unreasonable effectiveness of these methods in describing the empirical reality is persuasive. Thank you. Thank you. say that I'm so happy to be in a department like this, where not only can faculty can understand, but students can understand the question. I mean, 
we've been working on that for a long time, and I think we've been successful. The administration will not that. <laughs> 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 Let me begin They're with busy the maximizing interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, you would mention here, by Paolo, that PV equals NRT can be explained by energy conservation, which is a historical point. It was first understood in 15 something um, without any reference to micro. It was a macro law. And the point that Laughlin makes is that there are still many macro, macro laws, Einstein's laws, for instance, which cannot be derived from micro. That does not make them less rigorous. We have to figure out how to get there, yes, and it may or may not be micro, but anyway, they are absolutely correct long before any micro foundation was formed. I think we all agree that you don't need a micro foundation to get there, but it's good to know that if you do have a micro foundation, you can also get there. So that there's not a separation. I think inverted properties is the, is the thing in between. So then you have uh, another problem. Exponential and power laws have been explained by Yakovenko and his co-authors through energy conservation. So he says, you know, two people run into each other, and one person takes money, and the other. There's what I call the subway example, where they hold you up. But I, I think it's not a good example for wage distribution, because that's not how money appears in the pockets of workers or disappears in the pockets of capital. So maybe you could do it that way, that would make sense, but it hasn't been done that way. Um, so it doesn't make sense to me at an economic level to carry over a law that is well established in the physical level because of energy conservation. We have to show that there is a reason for the grounding. And that leads me uh, to for the behavioral micro. So <coughs> properties therefore have many possible micro foundations. That's clear. And so we need to distinguish among the micro foundations and they have to be capable of being distinguished. Very different issues. For instance, uh, I went to Catholic school in Karachi and uh, I could imagine, and perhaps I even heard this, apples fall to the ground because God is gathering them to him, as always say, in his bosom. And why do the ripe apples fall first? Because God likes them more. And why do the moon not fall? Because God wants to keep up that beauty in the sky, and so on and so on. That's non-falsifiable. <laughs> and even though it's complete, and then you can always explain everything with it, it's a tautology, and so you cannot use it. No science would permit you to use that in that micro. So we have to have, therefore, an explanation that we, on foundations that could be observed, perhaps not now, quantum mechanics, that foundations that could be observed at that time, and we're constantly striving to do that. And that's the scientific process, the real scientific process. Faith in the, in the possibility of explanation, detailed work on the empirical and theoretical side, a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, as always, you know, uh, uh, a very important question. Um, as it turns out, you do not need your body principle to make the principle of maximum entropy work. Again, the Delaware Lecture, among other contributions of James, actually highlights the following fact. If you read uh, all of Gibbs' contributions to the construction of statistical mechanics, there is not a single mention of ergodicity. Uh, the problem is that he died before he could finish his book. And you can see how the quality of the writing degrades as you get into the sections where this would come up uh, more. In fact, James makes the point, most interesting physical systems actually would never occupy all possible microscopic configurations available to them in the entire lifetime of the universe. So surely it cannot be that it is this capacity to occupy every possible microstate that makes the method work. What makes the method work is simply that um, if your description of a phase space or a system <coughs> is in line with the underlying rules of interaction or laws of motion, if we're interested in physics, of the system, then the macroscopic states that correspond to the greater multiplicity of microstates is just more likely to be observed than all others. And if you have a system that is very, very large n, that dominance is overwhelming, 10 to the big number. 
So it's not a statement that you are going to observe a system at its maximum entropy state. What it's saying is that it's simply kind of unlikely that you're going to observe a large N system uh, outside of something very, very, very close to its maximum entropy state. Um, that takes me then to the converse problem, or the inverse problem, which is the one we face in social science, which is different from the, how the problem was presented to physicists. Physicists had macroscopic knowledge from the laboratory table. They knew PV energy, right? Um, they also knew energy conservation. They were able to bring the two together with the use of this principle. We have a different problem because we don't know, counter to what all of our, a lot of our colleagues say, we don't know what the individual laws of motion are. We can you know, postulate production functions, utility functions, and impose all sorts of mathematical properties on them, and derive all sorts of nice results, but we're basically pulling it out of our nose. We don't know. So we need to go observe. And then we, we, we face a fundamental problem that I became aware of only very recently. Um, what we observe really should not be understood readily when I look at the characteristics for an individual enterprise or an individual as a vector of irreducibly individual quantities that pertain to the individual. Because we observe at certain time lapses, right, during which individuals interact. So when I observe a firm's EBIT and total assets and all sorts of other characteristics, I'm observing the result of an accumulation of interactions. So right off the bat, to then try to populate or, or estimate a model of individual behavior is already going to be on certain uh, slightly wobbly conditions. What saves the day for us is that despite this difficulty, a lot of, of, of variables that we know from theory are important, like the rate of profit, like people's wage, and so on, have these persistent distributions. So then how do we proceed? Well, if we keep observing a distribution, and it happens to be a distribution that is an entropy maximum for some phase space, then it must be at the level of description that that phase state, if you can describe it, you have offered a formal description of the resulting systemic expression of the laws of motion of the system. Now, sometimes you can describe these with statistical constraints on the distribution of the state. Sometimes that's not convenient, right? Um, if you can attach an economically meaningful account associated with a particular macroscopic moment constraint, then I think you have something that you're in the running at least, so long as it makes economic sense. I am not very impressed, for example, and I think we would agree on this, by a lot of work that has basically said, oh, it must be that this parameter measures the intensity of competition, and that are completely ad hoc. And you end up with, anyway, I don't want to cite specific papers, but there, is, there, is a, there are problems in the literature. There is an unavoidable element of art and of linking to other prior theoretical expectations that needs to be acknowledged explicitly, and then constructing accounts that make economic sense. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we can make some progress along those lines. Uh, I'll talk about the, about the token skew and all of that uh, next week, so we'll see if we talk about it, but uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know that seminar that we have had on what is wrong with the department seminars? This is what is right about it. We improve this more.